Good afternoon and welcome to today's Hump Day Hangout. I'm Steve Pegram, one of your co-hosts, and to this month's Hump Day Hangout focused on training. And uh, we want to thank the people at Penwell Fire Engineering uh, for the opportunity to do this Hump Day Hangout. Um, and we're going to be going into our topic in just a few minutes, uh, creating continuity within your organization, your company, your department through training. Um, we have a, a, several guests with us that we'll get to in just a minute, but uh, we do want to mention that if you'd like to send us a question during this live Hump Day Hangout, you can do so through Twitter at hashtag FE Talk. Uh, it's hashtag FE Talk on Twitter and uh, post a question on there. We'll try to get that uh, throughout the next hour while we're talking about our topic. Uh, I do want to pass along two pieces of information. One, for those of you that uh, are instructors that have submitted classes for FDIC 2016. The advisory board met this past weekend in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I know that the Penwell group, fire group, is uh, working on that right now, working on what classes are going to be invited to teach at FDI 2016, FDIC 2016. So be looking for that in another month or so. Uh, those announcements should be coming out. And, uh, you know, just to, to mention real quick, they've got about 260 spots to fill and over 900 applicants. So uh, it's a rigorous process to go through all the applicants. And, you know, obviously some people are going to be disappointed. They're not going to get accepted. Um, but don't lose faith and continue to write, to blog, and submit your uh, ideas to teach at FDIC 2016 and beyond because it is a great opportunity for those of us that have done it. Um, also want to mention the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, of which I'm the president currently, and uh, Larry and Jim, who are both our guests today, are on the board of directors. We'll be hosting our fall conference October uh, 15th and 16th. There's some pre-conference work workshops before that. It's in Knoxville, Tennessee, and you can go to isfsi.org to get some more information about that. So without further ado, we'll roll right into our topic today, and I'll throw it over to my co-host, uh, Aaron Heller. Aaron? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be a part of this again, and um, can't, can't beat the cast of characters we have today. This many guests makes it even easier for, for uh, Steve and I, because we've got so much knowledge to share with you with these guys. But uh, one of the things that we wanted to bring up today was it was about building continuity through training, whether it's just in your company, whether it's your, your uh, shift itself, or whether it's the entire department, and, and how do we do that, and are we doing that, and, and maybe why are we doing that, and the advantages of it. So uh, that's where we are as far as what we're going to do today. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Aaron Heller. I'm a captain in Hamilton, New Jersey, a former volunteer fire chief here in, in a small town called New Egypt. And I uh, had the good ability to, to get around the country and do a lot of training and meet a lot of people. And this is one of the topics that, that has come up about, that we've talked about throughout things. So uh, I just wanted to kick it off that way. And uh, I guess the first thing to throw out there is, to any of our guests, is um, have, you, have you seen it? Describe this way that are we trying to get continuity number one with our with our own guys with our own shift and then does it stay that way to the next platoon does it stay that way throughout the house and so on and you know and they told two friends and they told two friends so whoever would like to jump in I think that's a good place to start don't everybody jump in at once <laughs> Come on, Larry. No, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, definitely it's always a challenge when you have um, a bunch of engine houses or even one engine house from shift to shift to keep continuity. I think a lot has to do with how you set up your training division and how, you know, your training officer interacts with your crews. Um, in my battalion, I have five engine houses, and I can tell you that uh, we try to keep continuity, but uh, every company officer has a different uh, perspective, a different drive. Some are better than others at company training. Um, and then from shift to shift, you know, we have we have actually have a shift training officer per shift. But uh, even though they work great together, you can always tell that uh, one shift might be uh, a little bit uh, on the ball more than others. But uh, you know, it's definitely a challenge. And uh, for a cohesive fire agency or battalion, you know, that it's it's much needed. Um, but. Uh, it's just, I think a lot of it has to do with your people and the system that you have in place and the leaders above it. Yeah, I agree with you, Jim, on that. 
from a company officer standpoint, um, when we have three shifts, so those three shifts are um, trying to make sure that the other two captains feel the same way you do about training. Um, it's not it's not hard if you I think if you all have a meeting of the minds, I think when you have kind of the um, battle of the ship, so to speak, uh, and then there's some separation there, that can be a problem. But I think if, if one person or everybody agrees that, you know, let's kind of all keep our head in the, in the same game and we all may do things slightly different because of our personality of, that we give from ourselves, that we give to our ship, as long as we're all on the same page, it's going to benefit the, the uh, whole engine house better and uh, conversely, the battalion and, and on from there. But you have to change. I think it starts with you changing what you need to do in your own ship first, and then hopefully that influence the, uh, the rest of the ships. I, I really agree with you, Larry. I, I think so, too. I think that uh, it's got to start with the company officers, their, their crew. And obviously, we're, we're following what's being brought down from the leadership above us, but we have to get on the same page, just the three or four of us that are on shift together, and then, you know, the next group and so on and so forth. And, and uh, one of the questions I have is, how do we do that? Is it through written drill lesson plans? Is it through reviewing the SOPs? Uh, those sorts of things. How would you... How would you institute this for, for maybe some younger officers or some officers who are just trying to develop these types of things into their departments or maybe facing this type of thing? How do we how do we take that first step so we get on that same page? Aaron, what, what we did um, for uh, I think it was about three years we we lost the training officer position, uh, so it was kind of each shift somebody uh, kind of took it upon themselves to, to handle training a little bit. Uh, but once we got the training officer position back, uh, our staff got together, the three battalion chiefs, and uh, just uh, the, the chiefs of the, sat down, and, and we developed a plan a, a, as far as where we wanted to see training go. And, and one of the obstacles that we had to overcome was, again, with us being such a young department, we had to uh, basically get – each company officer on board to let them know what you just said, that training starts with them. If they have guys that can't do certain tasks, it's their responsibility to get them to that point. Then what our training officer did was uh, he, he took a real proactive stance as far as uh, giving the guys ideas of topics to train on throughout the month. And, and, and the guys knowing full well that towards the end of the month, three of those topics were going to be covered in a – uh, a department drill per se and, and at that time it, we were going to be able to monitor and see how each company officer w was uh, if the three topics were throwing ladder stretching holes and, uh, and and search then the company officers took care of that during the month and, and then when it led up to the drill the training officer and the battalion chief could actually observe to say okay guys you're getting it but we, you know we maybe do a little bit work more in, in these particular areas um, We've been doing that now for about six, well, hell, um, let's see, we're in September, uh, August, so, I mean, eight months that we've been doing that, and and we've seen where, where training, the, consi the consistency of training has gotten a whole lot better just in that little bit amount of time. Yeah, with us, um, a few years ago, we adopted, a, I don't know if you guys heard of Target Solutions, but Target Solutions, who were trying to address some of the issues of I ISO, and make sure that our training was documented. And what, what we've done in the past, we have what we call a, a written tri-monthly, and you can get a set of, um, of training topics from our training division uh, sent out to the firehouses. And our job was to make sure those topics got covered. However, when it came to do our inspection to see, you know, what our ISO rating was, that stuff wasn't, considered um, valid. So what we um, did is um, adopted target solutions and we have to electronically input our training. We have a list of training that we should cover each each month of the year and then we have to record it. So we have everything from going over things in um, textbooks to 
hands-on facilities training, and we have to record a certain amount of hours. And at the end of the year, we as company officers are responsible for meeting that certain amount of hours with our with our our crews. So that helps with us in really keeping in, in continuity because if we all have to be on the same page, and then some of those trainings that we do have to require us to interact with other uh, companies in our battalion. So when we hook up with those other companies, we're able to keep everybody accountable as well. So that's that's kind of worked out for us. I know it's kind of an expensive program, so it may not be um, something that can work for uh, you know maybe a volunteer department or someone who doesn't have the, the bigger budget. But in the St. Louis Fire Department, we allow for that in our budget, and also with that kind of documentation, we've able we've been able to increase and maintain the highest ISO rating as well as um, more doc better documentation of our uh, training and that helps with our continuity. Aaron, one of the things I was thinking about and uh, I know that you deal with this where you work, I'm not sure how the other guys deal with this, but where Aaron works I know that every time you're going to a fire or a serious incident you're going with multiple companies from multiple departments. Yes. So, so there's your department and your chief and then you know your your second do engine, your first do truck, maybe from separate departments. So how do you guys deal with that, uh, knowing that your second in engine, your first do truck, is always going to come from another agency whose training you don't control? Uh, in in all honesty, without bashing our own department, um, and I will make this clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of my department, and I'm not wearing department issued uh, items. Um, we don't do it very well at times. We're doing better at it, but it has ha it has really hampered our performance on the fire ground. Uh, I went to a fire recently where uh, there was an issue with nozzles, um, and uh, then there was a fire not long after that where there was an issue with nozzles, where one of the companies coming in operates a different style nozzle than everybody else, and it actually takes some real training to understand that nozzle. And when the second new engine company was told stretch off that rig, it was a serious problem. A truck company almost got burned because of the, uh, because of a lack of understanding of a nozzle. So it's it's becoming um, an apparent issue for us. We've always known it was there, but now that we're we're running some work together and, and catching some fires here and there, it's it really highlighted itself. So what we're trying to do, at least. From a from a dog kind of or you know the tail wagging the dog theory is companies have been getting together on platoon and 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 I know this happens in the volunteer companies as well where we're doing our drills but we're bringing I'll call over to engine 16 or I'll, you know 17 truck will call me and although it's not truly official like it should be and and we're working towards that with the higher ups we are starting to get more and more in depth into training with one another. Yesterday we did a VES drill at work with uh, with the guys from 16s who are the next district over from us. It just it breeds more familiarity and it does breed a whole lot more continuity as we progress. But that's something that, that it really should come from the top uh, or at least from middle management or the training division if you have a training division and it it uh, it can't be haphazard. Right now, ours is not nearly as as tightened up as I want it to be. But uh, my guess is that within the next twelve months or so, we'll, we'll be in a little better position with that. Yeah, and I, I kind of put you on the hook there to start off, but obviously yeah. I can say the same thing about my organization. And I am the chief, so I am responsible. But um, you know, in my neck of the woods, we use a combination system um, of not only career and volunteer but we have a tremendous amount of part-time people so because of that you know the traditional fire department has three shifts we have six uh, because our part-time people uh, work a six-day rotation versus our career full-time people work in every three-day rotation so one of the challenges we constantly have is for continuity of a, a new policy a new procedure a new piece of equipment uh, or any of our mandated training we have to do it at least six times and we'll still only hit about 80 percent of our staff um, so in a second I'd like to hear you know some of the other uh, panel members you know address that is how you, you get over that but I think Aaron brought up a great point 
is that companies that know they're going to run together, whether it's companies within one organization that regularly run together or companies, uh, departments that neighbor each other that have automatic mutual aid and are crisscrossing boundary lines, really need to train. And it seems like that's a huge deficit. And when I go around and I travel and talk to people, a lot of places talk about the fact that they run together, but they don't train together. And I know from a chief's perspective, you know, one of the challenges is time management um, but the logistics of it, you know, we don't want to take a company, if we've only got two engines on duty, we don't want to take one of our engines five miles out of our district to go meet a neighboring community for training. So we're working on a few interesting ideas of how to do that, that we may start uh, doing some training where we assign four companies, uh, one company each from four departments to do training. Three of those companies will go to a spot to do training, and the other company is going to go to a centrally located position to cover calls and basically back everybody up. Because we, we did have a fire uh, in this area of Ohio probably close to 20 years ago where all the companies in the department went to the far end of the district to do uh, an activity. And, of course, you know Murphy's Law, they have a working fire with entrapment at the furthest distance in the district and they got beat up pretty hard in the news media and by the families because um, it did result in a fatality because of the response time and that sort of thing. So, you know, when you're talking about the hires up and, and trying to do training, it is a high priority, uh, I think, that, that companies that work together train together, but also figuring out the logistics of how to get it done and how to do it while still being able to cover the calls and that sort of stuff. So anybody want to chime in on that? I our, our situation is pretty much like yours. We have 88 paid stations within St. Louis County, but it's represented by 42 different agencies, so you already see the logistical issues that we deal with. Um, Larry borders us. He's in the city of St. Louis, so he understands what he's dealing with to his west. But, um, you know, we, we just finally got together in the last couple of years, four or five years, and decided that, you know, group SOGs were the way to go, SOPs, whatever you call them. Um, Developing was ch was a challenge, but really the, the more uh, challenging part is actually implementation and the training aspect of the uh, SOGs. And we realized, hey, you know what? We don't play together as much as we probably should. Um, and, and getting together is somewhat complicated. Um, even if you do it regionally or if you you know you take a company, couple companies out of service, we'll do that. Or we'll move a company like you said, Steve. But uh, it can be a challenge. One of the things that we're looking at, though, is more technology so you can get the actual, you know, the information out there where it's accessible by everybody. Um, but once again, that takes a cultural, uh, you know, understanding to, to actually open up the documents and get them out there and look at them. Um, so, you know, technology is really uh, one avenue to go to try to get all the information out because you're absolutely right. You can't get everybody in the same place. Um, even my battalions, will, when we do battalion training, we'll have to split in two move somebody centrally located, it's very challenging. Yeah, I'm a, it's, it's funny to hear this because I'm spoiled, and I've been spoiled for 23 years because when you work in the city of St. Louis, we all know each other. And even though you may have different people, different shifts, maybe, you know, working for people of Southern, you basically know the basic job. You know, the only problem is, is how efficient does everyone do the job, but you know that what the first two companies going to do, what the second two companies going to do, because it's in our SOGs. So when you spoil like that, and I didn't realize it until I started teaching and traveling, and like how, you know, I'm thinking when you come from my perspective, you're thinking everybody operates like that, and when you go other places, and even when I start uh, hearing things and working with people in the, in the, down the county, like where Jim works, and realizing that it's not as automatic as, as I'm used to. So it's um, this is something I can't speak as an expert on or have any big solutions because, like I said, for 23 years, I already know. We, we kind of, it's kind of dangerous to probably say this publicly, but we, we, we take certain risks because we already know who's coming behind us to back us up. So it's not like we say, well, what agency is showing up next? We better take a minute to see. We kind of go for, forge ahead because we already know that our second new company, because our relationship with them in our district or if even if they're coming from another district, we just know basically they know some basic stuff 
that if they know we're committed in one way, they're going to operate another way. Always use the the uh, use the the example of like when well, I you say the Rams had the greatest show on turf. Kurt Warner didn't throw the ball to Isaac Bruce. He threw the ball to where Isaac Bruce was supposed to be. And he had confidence that Isaac Bruce was going to be there. And nine times out of ten, he was there. And that's why they had so much success in, in points, I mean, the yards after the uh, catch. So it's the same thing with us. We, we go in with a certain amount of confidence that this next end company is going to do a certain thing. And, and usually that's our success with it. So um, I'm I'm at this point a student of, of learning from you guys. So I'm like, if I was to somehow work for another agency and had to deal with that, you know, how would I do? It? How would I deal with it? And also the challenge of the continuity, like we're talking about now, that's that's got to be a challenge, you know. Larry, Larry, that's that's a really great way to paint the picture. You know, that you're throwing the ball to the spot and you expect the guy to be at the spot. And that that really is a good way of painting that picture, and and we're we're similar to that in where I work now because each crew knows who they work with for the most part, and even though the training isn't as tight as I would like to see it, they they know what to expect from one another. They know who's on the run card and that sort of thing, at least in most of the districts. But but it does become an issue. Chief Chief Emil, when when I went down to Bayou Cane, I got a real education. First off. <laughs> I needed an interpreter, but secondly, I, I got a good education on on talk about multi multi agency work and so forth. And you know, I know with you guys, it was such a developing department the first time I was ever there, and when you had just taken command for the most part. Um, but what we saw there down on the bayou is everybody really having to rely on each other pretty tightly there, and uh, so so maybe you could really speak to this pretty well. For, for us. Um, I'm going to give you a lesson. Uh, it's parishes for us. For you guys, it's counties. But um, in our parish, just in, in itself, uh, we, we have the Bayou communities, which are, are really further south, and then kind of everybody else. Um, so, so for us, and the way our district lies, um, we may utilize – uh, the neighboring department to our west, if that's where the call is for us, we may utilize the neighboring department to our east, south. No, it just depends what quadrant of our district comes in. One of the good things that, that we're seeing here, um, the, the the departments throughout our parish, they're, they're great for if you call, they will send the cavalry. So, so somebody's coming. There's no two ways about that. Um, the, the good thing that we're having from the chief level is um, – there are three or four of our surrounding departments that we do utilize for mutual aid, and, and they utilize us. Um, that we're we're diligently putting a plan together to to try to train together. Um, and for us, the the hardest thing is two of the departments are uh, ninety seven percent volunteer, uh, where we're hundred percent paid. Um, so logistically, it, it's uh, them being able to come and train together with us. Now the good thing is is our philosophy is we're on duty for 24 hours. You guys like to train in the evening, so we, we can we can accommodate that. Uh, weekends, a, a lot of volunteer organizations take take their weekends to to do training. Well, we're on duty for the weekend, so uh, you know we, we can make that work also. Um, our guys are excited about it because it's given them the opportunity to to not have to learn what the other department's capabilities are at the time of the emergency. We, we kind of can can know what to expect beforehand. So that that's the, uh, the the challenge that it presents for us, but um, I think we're all committed from the, the company officer level up to my position to, to do whatever it takes to make it work for the for the betterment of the department and, and the communities that we serve. I'm going to stir it up a little bit uh, just to get things going. <laughs> the uh, Here's a good question to question continuity, and that is, um, do you trust your mutual aid companies to do your RIT team? And, you know, a lot of us laugh and like, oh, yeah, of course, obviously. But there was a time when you knew that when RIT was new or you knew that you didn't know the training habits of your of your neighbors, 
there was a time when you wouldn't allow it. And my question is, is do you guys all allow it? And, and is this one of those real circumstances that you, you had faced once, you know, in, at least in your career? Yeah. Yeah. We, we live it right now. Uh, and, and it's a, you, Jimmy brought up a tremendous question that a lot of people would probably shy away from, especially the PC police. Uh, but we have, we have faced it head on. We had a volunteer company uh, to our, I guess basically to our east, uh, who was a very good fire company. Got out all the time, got out with four or five guys. They were very well respected, very well trained, and, and I had a lot of faith in them personally. And actually we had helped do a lot of their training for them. And over time there they had a uh, drastic changeover, so to speak, of some leadership and some membership and so forth. And all those folks that we had trained weren't the folks that we were starting to see show up at our calls as our writ. And it became an issue. And then they started scratching some calls. And, and we've seen this more and more in the area. And the chief hit it head on and, and went to their chief and said, listen, I'm taking you off the boxes until you get you can show me that you're trained. These personnel that are actually responding are trained or the other guys have come back or however we're going to do it. But we're not going to accept basically a, a half-assed group standing on the lawn just looking, just trying to look like they're they're writ trained firefighters. You know, anybody can dress up and, and play the part until they actually have to. Um, so you know, I, I've said that years ago. My my kid went went out on on Halloween as uh, you know a hockey star, but he couldn't skate worth a damn in real life. And uh, so that's kind of where we've been with writ. So it is it is a big issue. And and the company that I'm in is assigned writ to a big section of the county. For that simple reason that they know the training is maintained and the staffing is always maintained, but it is that's something that every chief and, and company officer should really be looking at, you know. And then, like Larry said, he knows when that company comes in behind him, they're qualified, capable, and they're going to follow procedure. That doesn't always happen in certain places. Absolutely, and I'm in I'm in a similar boat, and um, we will always get our writ from a neighboring department. Um, just because of the way we staff and the amount of apparatus and that sort of thing. Um, so that definitely is a challenge that Jim brings up. Um, it was a real big issue when RIT first started getting talked about, and departments were very specific on who they would use as their RIT, and we actually would dispatch them as a RIT company. And uh, what we've seen is that has changed a lot because the research that I've seen and the Mayday incidents that we've seen in the metropolitan Cincinnati area have been typically before the RIT company arrives. And a lot of times that's because the RIT company is coming from a mutual aid department, so they have a longer travel time to the incident. The initial company or two are operating on their own, uh, you know, maybe for the first five to ten, to, you know, depending on where the fire is at, up to 15 minutes, and the companies are still en route. So if, the, you know, Different places did it differently where it was the third due engine on the run card, might have been the fourth due or the second due ladder, whatever. Um, but they were designated a certain company as the RIT company. But we, we saw two things happen. One, we saw most of the maydays were occurring before the RIT team got there. And so the firefighters were actually rescued by those that were working around them in the hazard zone. And if you look at some of the nationwide statistics on maydays, most Maydays are alleviated by the companies operating with the Mayday company or with the Mayday personnel, not by the RIT team. And the other thing um, that we've seen is, you know, your company that arrives that's assigned as the designated RIT, but you have a water supply issue, you have a ventilation issue, you have a, a rescue uh, issue. So we see a lot of departments putting the RIT team to work mm -hmm. as a tactical company and then you're backfilling the writ with a company that's coming from even further away. So it, it's a constant challenge for us. Um, the one thing I preach when I teach here locally and in our department is get fast water on the fire, and then hopefully we won't have a mayday situation. Um, but it's definitely an issue for us, and I think we just found our topic for next month's Hump Day Hangout. <laughs> so, but a great question, and definitely a challenge for us, and I'd like to hear how other people are dealing with it. Well, we, we kind of fall in the same thing. We, we've been fortunate that uh, we, we've able we've been able to establish our, our own guys as our writ team. But they there there's tons of scenarios where um, 
writ for us would have to be um, probably from a mutual aid department. Um, and you know, each of, each of you had touched on it, where it's it's kind of a, uh, uh, the the politically correct way to say it. It's nothing personal. I mean, if uh, if some of our guys feel as though the the trust and the the knowing that the other guys know exactly what they're going to be doing isn't there, I, I would kind of expect a, a little bit of that feeling to be both ways if it were us providing somebody else. Now, for us, we know our guys are trained and, and they're going to do it the proper way, uh, but but I guess that brings us back to uh, training with the mutual aid departments on a little bit more consistent basis. If that's happening, then I think it'll help build the, the team integrity and, and build the teamwork between the two agencies. Um, or however many agencies are, are, are in place. So uh, I guess the answer to it for us is the more we train with, with the guys we're relying on, the, the more comfortable everybody in the situation is going to be. Uh, is it something that's absolutely 100% comfort right now? I, I don't think so, not here. Uh, can it be? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think if we work towards that and, and, and put a concerted effort together to, to, to train together to make sure we all are on the same page, we'll be okay. I, <clears throat> I didn't mean to create a, open a can of worms with that, but I mean, we could sit here and talk about RID all day long, I'm sure, and I'm, I'm on the same uh, belief as Steve, but once again, that's another show. Uh, but uh, really, you know, the, the bottom line is, you know, what's the yardstick here on training? You know, how do you know that you're doing things correctly? Because, you know, we don't make widgets here, and, you know, we're not saving people every day, and, you know, sometimes fire loss is just out of our control. Um, I, I think the true answer is after action reports. Um, I think you have to do them almost after every incident and be honest of how things are working, you know. You evaluate everything we've talked about today because, you know, you could sit there, and I've seen some after action reports or briefings where everyone's slapping each other on the back, you know, the fire went out and nobody got hurt. That's the worst thing you can say. You know, fires all go out. I mean, if you've been on a fire, you know, today that still is going, you know, yesterday that's still going on, no, it's, it's out. And, and hopefully no one got hurt. But the thing is, is, you really need to be honest with yourself and see how things worked. You know, if you find a needs deficiency, such as maybe your ventilation was bad or, your, your, or you, you overventilated, or if you didn't get a line in place in a proper time, why did that occur? You know, after action reports, you're going to find little things such as even radio communications, you know, uh, usage that you take for granted. But you got to be honest, and, uh, you know, you, you really got to find ways to make things better or evaluate if things are working. That's true because I think if you don't uh, follow up like that, you have a false sense of success, and that false sense of success can lead you to death. You know what I mean? It's a life and death situation that we deal with. So, um, <clears throat> When you, when you basically operate from that standpoint, I think that um, you get you give yourself an honest evaluation. And even if everything, like you said, fires go out, even if everything went out and nobody got hurt, that's, that's still a dangerous uh, label to put on it. Like if the fire went out and nobody got hurt, that's, that's dangerous because the next time we may not be so lucky. And, and the weird thing about it, and it's just human nature, I think, but sometimes we have to be better than human nature in our profession, is that it's human nature that if there was a fatality, then you get a fire tooth comb on everything. But if the fire goes out and nobody gets hurt, then nobody picks up the comb. <laughs> so I'm not saying it has to be as anal as when somebody gets hurt, but it should have be in the same ballpark. If it's in the same ballpark, it can help us do better each time, especially with the dynamics of things changing. Um, like we are doing with the, uh, you know, principles of modern fire attack, things have changed and we have to change with them. I'll take it a step further and, and, and agree with both of you that not only the after action review for a fire incident or a training scenario, but again, with, with us being a young department, I think um, as an officer, whether it's a, a chief level officer or a company officer, it, it's our job to, to learn from everything we do. Um, and, and the same principles that we use to, to review uh, a post-incident, we can review if there was a disciplinary incident that just occurred, you know, at your department, 
take the opportunity to learn from it and better yourself. And and it, and if you do that with just about every aspect of our job, I just don't see how that that can't benefit your organization. That's a great point, Chief. And uh, I think we don't pay attention to that. And you said something there about your organization being a younger organization. Um, what about organizations, and I know we're, we've experienced this a little bit, where the company officer uh, is now the boss of the company or the crew, whatever, um, but they have less experience, per se, than some of the people that are riding backwards. And, um, you know, and that, and that can be an issue and stuff like that. You know, just because you're the lieutenant or you're the captain doesn't always mean that you need to run the drill. And I think that, you know, Aaron and I have talked about this before on previous hump day hangouts that, you know, the senior person or the person that's most competent and has the most experience with a particular topic is maybe the best person to be teaching. Not doesn't always have to be the lieutenant or captain. And I just wanted to throw that out there. But also, um, are you guys seeing, uh, where do you see your SOPs, SOGs fall into the training? Do you design and implement your standard operating procedures first and then your training is built on that? Or have you seen, what I've seen a lot of places is there's a book of SOPs, SOGs, but what the individual companies are doing when they're out on the training ground doesn't necessarily reflect that. Um, and I think it's real important, especially for those of us that are running mutual aid with multiple departments, that we have like, if not the same, standard operating procedures, and then our training is based on that. We're kind of in that that quagmire right now. Um, the majority of our staff, what they're asking for is that our SOPs and SOGs um, are written such that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they can take those to the drill field and basically train off, off of the uh, what the the policy and procedures say. So we're we're in the middle of I don't want to call it a massive rewrite, uh, but we're reviewing everything and and, and basically fixing what's uh, what needs to be tweaked. One of the good things is a lot of the surrounding departments, um, which we all do it here, is uh, we're, we're not above stealing somebody else's SOPs and SOGs. Um, and, and, and there's a few of us that communicate back and forth, uh, hey, look, we just put this new policy out on this, or, or another chief will send me something. So um, we're, we're getting there, even if, if, for lack of a better term, if we're not trying, we're, we're at least accidentally working towards that. So... Um, yeah, it's an issue that um, that's being addressed for us, and and it, and it's kind of um, it, it, it almost it helps us to ensure we're doing it the right way because we we're taking the input like you just said, and we don't want to have a book that oh that's the rules, but this is how we play. Um, we're we're putting it together to where it's not just a document that we can hang our hat on and say we have, but it's actually a working useful document that um, that'll help the efficiency of the department, whether it's in, in fight and fires training or, or just regular station life. So yeah, we're, we're addressing it and it, I think it's an ongoing process for us, as is everybody else. Steve, I think your question really illustrates the importance of, you know, company officers who are educated and have experience, um, you know, not only on the fire ground but in the training setting. Uh, you know, we, we, we have, we drill pretty hard on our SOGs and, uh, you know, we bring them and we try to train to a T, not to a T, but to the point where the people understand the SOGs because it's important. Larry can, can will will also talk about this. Is in our area, we don't have true truck companies. He only has one per district. I basically have none out of the 88 companies in the county, and it all revolves around your arrival order. So if you arrive second or third in our in our system, you're a truck company. So you have to know your truck company skills and your engine company skills. I know a lot of it, I know a lot of the country operates like that. Um, but uh, if you mix that up and you don't have the truck company functions on a fire ground, you're gonna you're gonna have issues. Therefore, you know the, the SOG becomes very important. However, we also understand that there are times to call audibles, and to truly understand when an audible is called really takes a lot of experience from a company officer. When they arrive, they do their size up, they see something that's not you know normal or not right according to the SOG. You know, they're not going to be stood up in my office and ask why they didn't go boom, boom, boom by the SOG. But, you know, they are allowed to call audibles. And, you know, that once again goes, you know, how do you build that? You know, the answer is, you know, how do you gain experience in today's day and age when there's not a lot of fires? 
And you know, I always ask, well, what's more, what's more difficult, building SOPs, getting training, or getting uh, you know experienced company officers? Obviously, the answer is going to get experience because some of these agencies just don't have the fires like we used to. And uh, you know, building a training program is challenging, but it can be done. Building SOGs is challenging, but it can be done. But it's experience. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's why one reason we changed our for SOPs to SOGs because when it was the language was SOP, you were held to almost every letter of that procedure. When we started making it change to SOGs, the whole um, vision of that was to make it um, SOGs to for guidelines, which means, like Jim said, you can call the author if you show up. The only thing our chiefs and the powers to be um, charges with is that you better be able to back up your decision if something goes wrong and be able to justify what you've done. Because if you just try to be a cowboy just to be a cowboy, you're going to get burned in more ways than one. So with us, um, we have the latitude now to call the, the, the audible in case the situation <coughs> um, presents different. And um, and I was I was thinking about something I think Steve said earlier we were talking about uh, and I think Jim touched on the two that experience um, you know or, or a training and you know how do you train if, if someone's younger if the captain is younger or the lieutenant is younger or whatever and I'm I'm really big on you know I don't always have to feel like I have to be the point guy in training I think I have to be the guy to make sure that it gets done and orchestrate and oversee it. But it's, it's no big deal for me to tell somebody who I know in my crew who's an expert and maybe ropes or not. So maybe an expert at uh, teaching forceful entry. You that you you you're the point guy, and, you, and when we instead we're going to train on forceful entry, and I need you to bring the pain and, and, and come with it's something that we can all learn from. And what that does is that what I found it do it it makes it a lot easier to do my job because when they do their job and then they feel empowered on wow I'm being charged to do this training I don't necessarily have to listen and I could pretty much do the training the way I see fit long as it fits in the guidelines of us learning they feel empowered and when they feel like they contribute to the team like that it makes my job a whole lot easier when we do get a call and when, when our, um, our, our you know we get tested so to speak at the scene I already know that this person is going to bring the pain, and they're not necessarily waiting for me to for that direction. Like I said, the overall thing I'm ultimately responsible for, but that that individual uh, empowerment or, or helping them see their potential, it not only helps the team, but it helps them as they're aspiring to be company officers themselves, and hopefully, what they'll do is turn around and. And, and pass that same torch because when I came on the job 23 years ago, really heavy on the company officer had to know everything and everything started from what that person knew and how they trained and you kind of stood in line and waited as a follower. But now it's a whole lot more powerful to make sure that not only that your guys, your, your, your firefighters know, but it's a whole lot more powerful for them to actually demonstrate it and be in charge. And then use that that strength and that empowerment to help enhance the team. I just got a text message from one of my battalion chiefs that reminded me exactly what you're talking about. Uh, for us, uh, we have um, several times a month that the topic is open for our engineer, our firefighter uh, on that particular crew. It's their responsibility to come up with the drill, conduct the drill, and 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 we're seeing that where it, it's empowering the guys, it's helping with buy-in, it, it's letting them see that they're part of the team, and, and uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's making training a, a little funner, if you will, because everybody's involved. It's not just somebody else. And one, one of the things that when I got here um, that, that we really had to work on was uh, there, there was a, a, a culture of it's not my responsibility. Well, we, we changed that pretty quick. Uh, and, and we had to. It, it wasn't a, a, a if it was going to change. It's it's going to change, and it has. Um, and that's one of the the, the things that helped um, was guys saw that you know as a company officer, uh, the 
the excuse of, well, he just doesn't know how to put on his bunker gear, just wasn't going to cut it anymore. Um, and, and this helped everybody come together, and, and the guys know, hey, uh, and then they almost take it as a, a kind of a competition. Hey, I, I want to do a better drill than the last guy did. I want to do a better class than the last guy did. So uh, it, it's working great. Uh, it, some people, most of the guys here enjoy it because they, they see the results. Some people think we're nuts for doing it, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it works for us. It, it truly does. I, I think you guys you guys hit some really important parts, and, and one of the ones that I really like is you're preparing the next wave of firefighters to take our jobs, and that's good because a lot of places they aren't going to do that. There's there's that hold back, and I've seen it I've seen it in both career and volunteer sides where they the you know the leadership will say no this is how I tell you to do it this is how you're going to do it and this is why we're going to do it this way and so forth and so on. And they've done that for so long. Yet now, when these folks move on, the next level are not prepared to take their place, or they're they're or they're finding a, a poor layer of leadership, so to speak. So for us to empower them now and say, hey, you know, brother, you're the senior guy on the tour, and you know, you're excellent at forcible entry. Show the guys the irons, or you're great at ropes and knots. Show them show them what we're doing. You do. You get buy-in with the guys. They they appreciate that you're giving them that bit of a spotlight potentially and the good guys are going to step up and then that just makes the team stronger, it makes you better and we talk about as we go continuity wise now the company officer moves up to battalion chief but he can look behind him and know that the captain or the lieutenant is going to do it the right way because he already saw that. So I think you guys hit it right on the head. Absolutely. Real quick, we have a uh, question from Twitter and for the panel, and that is, how do you handle follow-up training? Uh, if you get a encounter problems on the drill or the drill doesn't go the way you expected it or you don't see the companies performing the way you expected them to perform, do you start over and repeat with all crews, all companies, uh, or do you just look at rewriting the lesson plan for next time? Um, how do you guys deal with that? type of scenario. I think it really, uh, I guess it really is, is specific to the problem, um, but it, it really is whoever's running the drill has got to be cognizant of, of, of good documentation and really oversee the training. You know, if they encounter a problem that, uh, let's say the whole, two-thirds of the battalion or two-thirds of the training is, is having, then obviously that's a systematic problem that has to be addressed again. And yeah, I, I would I would have that uh, re, I would have more training on that, or uh, you know, go back and retrain on the aspect. You know, like for example, we just went to the new 800 megahertz radio system. We're constantly seeing you know the wrong channel or the you know, and it's not complicated once you get it, but it's something we haven't done. So therefore, yeah, that's that's a very um, you know that can really throw a wrench into your operation. So yeah, that's got to be addressed. Ladders, another ring. But I think you know if you, you see one problem from a specific engine company or a specific individual, uh, I you know training first of all the, the the whole training schedule is very tight, uh, especially for agencies like us who are paramedic and firefighters. You got to have two training schedules, and then if you have you know, special operations, you have those, uh, you know, that training schedule. So, you know, I, I, I preferably would not, you know, put up our training docket just on one individual, but I would make sure that that company officer has, um, you know, that, that company training that addresses that, and, you know, and hits it hard. I, I, I agree with you. I, 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 we have to stay on, on point. We have to stay on schedule. But if I see something that's wrong during training, you know, we're, we're not, unless it, it's a repetitive thing that we're seeing on every shift, but as we see it go wrong, I think it's time to address it right then and there while it's fresh. Whether it needs to be a change in a lesson plan whether or it needs to be a, uh, a change in, in how we're delivering that training. Uh, but yeah, I would, if we, if we have the time, Let's get it. Let's not only, you know, Larry. Larry said a good point. He said, "Let's let's do it till we get, can't get it wrong, basically," and and I think that's the key. 
you know, and the repetitiveness is, is, is everything with muscle memory and, and how we react to what we're doing. And that, that's important. But yeah, if it's, if it's going wrong, we don't want to continue it to go wrong. We don't let that just keep shooting down the, shooting down the track the wrong way. Right. So I think you've got to stop it. I think you've got to make an immediate correction. If it's something minor we have to tweak, eh, we, we might be able to let that go, and, and then we'll address that as we, as we develop deeper. I, I agree, you know, correcting the problem when it happens. I think that, you know, yeah, you don't want to embarrass somebody, but there's a point here. This is, this is the stuff we're doing is dangerous, you know, and we're all big people in this. And in all honesty, you know, every putting on a gold badge or a white shirt or something is easy. The hardest part is conflict. And you have to realize that, you know, you, you have a job to do as a company officer, the chief, um, to, to address conflict every once in a while. And it's part of your job, you know, and, and conflict actually is healthy. You know, it makes things improve. It makes things change. Um, without it, you know, what, 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 how are we going forward? But, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's difficult at times, but it's, it's an absolute necessity of the job. Yeah, I'll, I'll share with you guys, and, and the, one of the issues I had recently was uh, a drill that, you know, definitely was sent out to all three shifts. I sent it out, and it was for a specific project and I asked them to videotape it um, and the results were not what I was expecting and what I was hoping for and but when I really looked into it you know the responsibility really was mine because my expectations and my instructions left too much area for personal interpretation if you will and uh, you know, so I, sometimes you got to make sure if you're the boss or you're in charge of training, or even the company officer telling a crew what you want them to do. You got to make sure that your expectations of what they're doing are correct, but also that you give them the right instructions on what you're expecting them to do. Otherwise, we're all firefighters. We're all going to input our own uh, slides that we have in our slide tray, experiences that we have, things that we've seen online, things that we've experienced maybe in other departments and tweak it our own little way. The thing, you know, and instead I got 23 different versions of it. And uh, so definitely from a chief's perspective, you know, making sure that your expectations and that your instructions are correct. Um, I think when Mr. Carey asked the question about uh, you know, definitely that's a drill we're going to have to go back and do again, but before we do it, I'm going to have to make sure that I outline what my expectations and what my instructions are and what our goal is of the training. You know, why are we doing it? And, and maybe some of those things I think we're missing. I, I couldn't agree more. And someone brought it up earlier and said, you know, do you have actual lesson plans? Uh, we, we have drill safety plans. And not only is it critical for safety, you outline your safety aspects, but you also do exactly what you said, Steve, and that's outline your objectives and expectations. Uh, you know, when you take Instructor 1, they say, you know, whenever you build, or Instructor 2, whenever you build a PowerPoint, don't build a lesson plan around a PowerPoint because you're, you're going to lose the objectives. And it's, you know, so critical, even on the, even on the fire ground uh, or the training field, same thing. You know, have your objectives set, have your expectations set, and also, you know, detail the safety plan. That, that's that's very important. We we learned that the hard way. We started writing our, our lesson plans a little tighter than they had been over the years, and we've gotten much better results from it that way. And and again, we go back to that that word of continuity. We have four shifts. We, we're lucky we work a four platoon system, so four captains can interpret it four different ways if it's not very clearly spelled out. And um, and their delivery style may may be very different, which leads the the troops in a whole other path, basically. So by by tightening up that drill lesson plan, although it's written on, on paper, so paper bends, uh, I, I feel that it does it gives them that roadmap to follow, and, and I think that that really works. And and I've I've got another question for you, and and this is something we've done, and I don't know if everybody's doing it or, or the thoughts out there of doing it, but. One of the things that I found when I was a volunteer chief, I, I you know I was a very young volunteer chief. Steve and I served as chiefs at the same time here in Jersey, which you know, lucky lightning didn't strike when we were in the same building. But uh, one thing that I did, I tried to run all the drills because I thought you know I knew it. I was the chief. I was in charge. They got tired of hearing my voice, and even in the company level and and the training divisions level, sometimes they get tired of hearing the guy, the battalions, or the or the captains in training giving all this training. 
So now we know we all know the, the back and forth stories about all the new training companies that have popped up, some good, some bad, some unbelievably good. You know, is this something that, that you're seeing out there? Because I, I can tell you in my department, one example is we formed a SOC unit and and it's a very busy, active group training and, and really improving upon themselves with some very, very talented guys. One thing that I didn't feel we were good at was was basically man the machine type stuff that type of entrapment. We could do extrication all day long. We're doing great work with high angle uh, and, and we're, we're starting to branch out. But that was something where we, we looked and we said, you know, we don't have anybody within who we feel could deliver it to a point where guys are going to go, yep, that's how I would do it. I'm buying in. So we hired, and I was in charge of this, hired the best company I felt available in, in, and brought them in and, and, you know, they took good care of it. And now, We've built our SOP based on that training, and we've equipped ourselves based on that training, and it's really, really been beneficial to my department. And is that something that that you guys have? The first thing that came to mind, Aaron, is that you know sometimes we're not the experts in everything, and I think that's a challenge for fire departments is that we think that we're supposed to be the experts in everything, and sometimes you have to realize that you might not be the swift water rescue, hazardous materials, technical rescue, engine, truck, tanker, fire department that you want to be. And, you know, some of that's funding, some of that's resources, personnel, and, and, and things like that. But sometimes you just need to hire the expert. And um, there's a lot of different ways of doing that, whether it's spending money uh, to do it or partnering with agencies to do it. But sometimes it's best, like you said, to bring in the, the person that has the expertise that not only has taught it and trained on it, but also the person who's actually responded to those types of emergencies. And I've seen it a lot where there's some very credible instructors out there, and we've talked about this in our previous Hump Day Hangout. There's some very smart people teaching stuff that they've never done in reality. And their programs are good. They've got good video. They've got good pictures. They even have a good message. But then there's an issue of credibility to their continuity of the uh, program. And uh, we're about out of time, but just throw that out to the, the rest of you and any final thoughts before we wrap this month's uh, Hump Day Hangout. For us, we uh, we brought in some guys from outside, and uh, it, it was it, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I mean, we had a situation again, and I hate to keep saying this, but but the youth of our department, um, and you know, uh, you've got uh, Ray McCormick. Uh, Champo, uh, Aaron Heller, and, and, and Bart Simpson are, are teaching my guys down in South Louisiana. And, and what it did for our department was just absolutely uh, amazing. It, it pulled the guys together. They they started getting it a lot more. And, and, and it was it was stuff on training that that my guys only could read about in books, and they were seeing it live, hands on. And, and being able to apply those drills. So it paid dividends for us that, that we're still feeling today, and hopefully we're going to feel for a long time to come. Uh, that being said, uh, thanks for having me. It was great. I enjoyed it. Um, uh, it, it was a unique experience and, and uh, honored to be part of the panel. Yeah, I want to say this, uh, kind of piggyback on that. Thanks for having me out. Um, I really appreciate it. I see this stuff, and then now to be part of it is kind of surreal. Um, it's funny you brought that up though, because Jim and I were talking about that earlier. How um, when you're around your own um, department or your own area, people kind of get tired of hearing your voice that you're so common, they don't really take you seriously. But if I go 100 miles away and teach a leadership class, I'm I'm the man, you know. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of weird. And so we we it's funny you said that. So sometimes you might need a different voice to come in and say the same thing you would have said or like you said it might be a better fit to the expertise and, and as long as the people are getting the, the quality training that's the bottom line who cares who says as long as they're credible Jim final thoughts uh, first of all thanks for having me it's been a blast uh, always talking about training or fires is, is always uh, a bonus but, uh, you know, uh, the thing to take away is, that, you know, just be honest about your situation. I think that's, that's critical. You know, don't think you're the best organization in the world because there's always room for improvement. And uh, continuity is one of those areas where we can always improve and, uh, you know, look for ways to, uh, to make it better. 
Yep. And I think this is a great discussion, and I think Aaron and I got some ideas from it for a few more Hump Day Hangouts. So, mm -hmm. final words, Aaron, on this month's talk? Nah, we, we're, we're blessed. You know, we get to sit around and, and talk to however many folks tune in, and, and with, with three great guests who've been there and done that, and, uh, you know, what better thing to do? You know, I skipped a day at the beach for this one, so this is well worth it. Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm looking forward to next month. You know, see you guys. On the, see you on the fire floor, right? That's right. We will uh, see everybody next month. Our next Hump Day Hangout focused on training is uh, the first Wednesday of the month, which will be September 2nd. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, on next month's Hump Day Hangout. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. All right. Thank you. Thanks.